you drive a car at a certain speed and the, wall, the wheel may fall off. Uh, and those issues around uh, safety, safety of cars, the safety of products as well. Uh, was a toy going to strangle your child? Was um, the toaster going to electrocute you? Was something that the consumer movement really around the, the 1960s, I was born around the time of unsafe at any speed, the 1960s and 1970s was really born around. And the huge advances that we have had uh, in car safety with a dramatic fall uh, in uh, road traffic accidents, uh, for example, fatalities you know, over that period of time, despite many, many more cars on the road, but also far greater uh, product safety uh, in relation to everyday goods and services, really is a tribute for the kind of the work and thinking, but the movement and action that is required uh, around these new kinds of areas. And the issue of safety online uh, features very highly now in the new sets of issues, and I'm really pleased to be here this morning as a, as a warm-up act uh, for Tom Watson uh, to talk a little bit uh, about this. I was going to go a little bit further back, Graham, uh, actually in terms of consumer safety and consumer rights uh, to the, um, uh, the, the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta was in some ways uh, the first text that made reference uh, to issues of uh, consumer safety and, and protection. Uh, one of the things that it talked about was a, um, a single measure throughout the land uh, you were always at risk in being um, uh, ripped off whether when it came to um, uh, your kind of pint of beer or your uh, milk uh, uh, or your loaves of, of bread. And the Magna Carta said, no, we need a single measure throughout the land. Now many years on, with broadband being advertised at speeds up to uh, kind of one, two, five, fifty uh, kind of meg, it, it, you're not quite sure still whether we've got that full one measure uh, in, in place. But I want to look at and play on this idea, uh, both of product safety, but also of, of consumer rights in relation to uh, digital safety and what, uh, what that may uh, mean. For my money, and, and I think the Digital Britain report is a, you know, is a very heavy, weighty document. Uh, it bears thinking about, it bears working uh, through. Uh, but to my mind, for all of the, the, the advances that that brings, Digital Britain stopped well short of looking at the uh, online space, the digital space, from the perspective of the people that will be using those services, uh, are telling them what they can do rather than these pages and reams about what they can't do, the kind of, um, you know, the industry pressures uh, around kind of piracy and uploading kind of were, were run through. So there were elements within that but I think still there is far more work to do. And the fact that you know, we can have made such advances in policy, the commitment to a universal service, uh, commitment on broadband, for example, is very progressive. Policy needs to move as fast as the technology uh, is moving. And the technology is moving fast. Um, you may or may not be a, a fan of um, uh, Ray Kurzweil, um, but Ray, in his book, uh, The Age of Singularity, um, talks about the speed of technology. And so if you compare technological innovation uh, in the year of the, uh, of the Magna Carta being signed through with technological innovation today, and uh, I can't remember the exact numbers that he cites, but it's something like, um, you know, there's as much technological innovation uh, uh, today that is something like, you know, 230 times the innovation that you would have seen in a single year in the 13th century. So the pace of change is quite, uh, quite dramatic. And we think of change in generational terms, that it's different for our generation or the next generation. But no, it's much uh, more fractured than that, much speedier than that as, uh, as, as well. So the, the, the Digital Britain is uh, out. Today, the um, uh, advertising uh, standards uh, uh, association closes its consultation on the review of the codes of uh, advertising practice, which is a kind of, again, a pretty uh, weighty document itself, 300 plus pages with, uh, with appendices, the first review for uh, five uh, years. But again, actually not something that really looked at issues around uh, privacy uh, principles you know, at all, and only one small alteration when it came to uh, children in relation to, to databases. 
So very fast moving field, but the issue of digital safety uh, is far from, uh, from, from central. Now, Graham, you talked about a, a kind of cocktail that is there uh, online, and actually 70% of the information uh, online uh, is created by, uh, by individuals. So, you know, we are part and parcel uh, of this. And what I want to explore is some of the principles that I think we need to look at uh, in constructing uh, digital safety. And I'll talk about these as about uh, cost, consent, uh, confidence, uh, control, and, and, and correction. The first is around the new world that is uh, uh, emerging. Commissioner Kuneva uh, talked about personal data being the uh, oil of the internet, the new currency of the, uh, the digital world. Uh, um, Stephen Carter himself, Stephen talked about all content in future being paid for either by people's uh, personal attention spans uh, or by their uh, personal uh, data. And the way that technology is going with you know, embedded RFID uh, in products, so products being digitally signed, we're not going to be surfing through the internet, as you'd be aware. We're going to be walking through the internet. And again, in that context, uh, privacy matters uh, very much in, indeed. And the debate around privacy tends to be a bit of a standoff uh, between those who are privacy advocates, who do a fantastic uh, job in protecting privacy, uh, and, and then the kind of commercial side and interest. And in reality, what we find and what we know from our research and contact with consumers up and down the country is that people have got a very nuanced view. Privacy is extraordinarily important to people. It's a bit like that sort of rusty central heating system. You know, it's fine as long as, you know, it works. If it goes wrong, then it can suddenly feel very wrong, very personal. Uh, in a report for uh, Richard Thomas, not too long ago, 94% uh, uh, of, of people argued that uh, protecting people's personal information was the most important social concern along with uh, preventing crime. But we know from our contact with people that actually uh, people are all con consumers are also willing to trade off uh, anonymity for access to services. Um, and the rules of that and how that is done and developed I think that fits very much with the, with the kind of themes with which Graham uh, opened this uh, conference. Uh, the National Consumer Council, one of the predecessor bodies, along with Energy Watch and Post Watch, to Consumer Focus, we're a kind of seven-month-old organization, uh, a baby ourselves. Um, but the National Consumer Council published a, a book which put it very well, um, uh, and it's called The Glass Consumer, the idea that actually growing up in a transparent and increasingly uh, transparent uh, world. But it also raised both the positives about some of the pr privacy enhancing uh, uh, technologies that are out there that tend to be relatively neglected, but also the risk of uh, consumer backlash, just as we have had in relation to the, the government disks going from one department uh, to, uh, to, to another. Um, we've seen the rise of uh, behavioral profiling um, and uh, behavioral uh, targeting, and then this sort of separation, um, uh, you know, semantic separation in some sense between uh, personal data um, and then personally identifiable uh, information, which is a kind of quite a, a thin distinction to make. And it's on that distinction uh, which quite a lot of the, uh, the new... Uh, business models that are emerging uh, around behavioral profiling, behavioral uh, targeting are based. The idea that you can look at um, information that is about people but step short of uh, you know, getting into the personal information which then identifies them. But of course that's a very, very thin line indeed. And actually the way that uh, many of the technology innovations are going, uh, it's a line that really starts to um, disappear entirely. There was a recent study uh, on social networking sites for the University of, uh, of Texas um, where scientists developed uh, an algorithm which turned uh, anonymous data into names and addresses. Um, and what they found was a third of those, uh, and I'm sure we've got more than a third uh, signed up to sites like Flickr and uh, Twitter this morning, but a third of those uh, on sites like um, both Flickr and Twitter 
uh, can be identified from completely anonymous uh, Twitter uh, graph. And as social networks become more heavily uh, used, then I think we will find it far more difficult uh, to maintain a kind of a veil of anonymity that we've taken for granted uh, in, the, um, uh, in the analog uh, world. Uh, and that, there has been moves on that uh, more in the States, I would say, than uh, here. The Federal Trade Commission uh, uh, has done some quite good work um, looking at privacy uh, impact assessments, and I think there's, there's, a, there's a potential for the far greater use of that uh, uh, here in the UK as well. That's a little bit about costs, and, and now this issue about uh, uh, consent, um, which is, have we really been asked uh, in relation to this? And, and Graham made the distinction between uh, this world of kind of, you know, opt-in, uh, another tick box uh, to, um, to, to, to have, uh, versus uh, opt out, and the real question about you know whether we've assented uh, to the the risks uh, that are involved. And I think an understanding of the risks and a trade-off of the risks is the right way to view uh, some of these issues around privacy uh, and uh, and safety, um, uh, but an informed basis uh, you know for uh, for that. Um, let me move on to the issue then of, of confidence. Confidence is uh, is key in the sense that you need consumer confidence for online markets uh, to develop and to, uh, to flourish. Only if people are confident uh, will those services work. So some of the, 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 the scams and scandals that we have had have a very direct uh, and damaging economic uh, impact. And those may be the, um, uh, the Nigerian scamsters, uh, but equally it may be um, some of our kind of um, uh, communications companies um, in the early days of kind of broadband bundling that really treated consumers uh, uh, with a shoddy, very, very poor deal. And I can think of that as almost sort of competition vandalism. You take people that are likely to switch to broadband and then you give them a appalling deal, uh, terribly hard to ring through uh, onto the um, customer support services, uh, very slow, uh, kind of, you know, switching, leaving people kind of off. All of this is actually bad uh, for, for businesses and it, it is a good example of where better consumer protection supports successful business and markets. Uh, if you have the kind of free-for-all, if you have some of the assumptions that are there in, in digital Britain that we really don't want to regulate, let's have a look at self-regulation, if that doesn't work then we might have to do something, but it's really not what we want to do, which is pretty much a, a direct paraphrase uh, of what digital Britain says, doesn't start from the right place, because the right place is how do we make a success of this economy and consumer safety, digital safety uh, and digital confidence uh, is core to making a, sex, a success uh, of that. Now I know you've got time uh, later today focusing in on the issue of uh, children and I think that's a very good example because in some ways uh, many of these issues uh, are difficult issues about well you know what would adults what can, counts as consent or not whereas with children it's absolutely clear that there's some extraordinarily shoddy practices going on there that it is a bit of a, a cowboy republic uh, online there in the relation to the treatment of children and I speak from a uh, from a basis of research having completed with um, Agnes Nairn, marketing professor, uh, a book earlier this year called uh, Consumer Kids, uh, which draws on research with over 3,000 uh, children and with, uh, with parents. Um, and I think some of the issues that are there, um, we, we look, for example, at children's uh, use of technology. Children are brilliant pioneers of technology. The fastest growing virtual worlds are those populated by children. These are not bad things by any means. Some of them are absolutely brilliant. Uh, there's an island uh, called Wyville, uh, which is populated by three million children, uh, online uh, island. Uh, English is the, um, the, the, the leading language. And, and one morning, uh, all the inhabitants of, of, of Wyville, all under 16, woke up to find that their, their island was absolutely littered with trash trees and rubbish and everything like that all over their screens and they had to work all the way through the next 48 hours to clean up their island, to clean up their virtual world. And, and Wyville, which is a science-based virtual community, had run this as a simulation of what climate change would bring uh, to islands and what devastation it is having and will have. It is a very educational uh, exercise. 
So although you know, I showed that children now spend over twice the amount of time on screen than they do in class, which means that we have to rethink our childhood, the idea of being about family and home. Now, the commercial world is still there. Not all of that is by, by any means at all, and we need more sophisticated ways to be able to distinguish what is safe and what is not. Children's bedrooms are kind of real very sort of media bedsits uh, today. You go in there, you get music, uh, TV, uh, phones, uh, in, you know, text messaging, instant messaging, voice over internet protocol, games consoles, DVDs or uh, uh, VCRs, uh, kind of MP3, you know, an incredible array of technology. Um, you, when I was young, you know, I used to be sent to my bedroom. Um, and children today don't go to their bedroom to switch off, they go uh, to switch on. But much of what they find there uh, on screen uh, includes uh, deceptive marketing um, and aspects that I think raise questions and concerns uh, around uh, harm. Uh, one quarter uh, of the adverts, for example, on sites most popular with children uh, are actually for products and services that are age-restricted. Uh, either over 16, 17, uh, or 18. Uh, gambling, intimate dating sites uh, are, are certainly part of uh, that. Uh, my colleague Agnes Nairn, who I co-wrote the book with, um, uh, I was talking to her daughter, Sean, who, who was saying, you know, she had to say to, to Agnes, Mum, it's completely not normal, you know, for a mum to come downstairs to speak to her children, saying, I've had an incredible day's research, and you wouldn't believe the porn sites that I've been on. Uh, and this is taking in the imprimatur of, uh, of, a, of a kind of 10-year-old to have a look at the experience of, uh, of, of online sites and the sites that are there through uh, for children and used uh, by children. But in terms of adverts as, as, as well and marketing, um, only a minority, a small minority of, of, of adverts uh, in those sites used by children are labeled as adverts uh, or as, as ad, and a very significant number uh, a quarter of those are kind of embedded uh, in, uh, in content, so very hard for, people, for children to know when they're being marketed to uh, or not. Now, in many ways, I think the Internet itself is a child. That in many ways, I think what we're seeing is, is, a, is a phase of experimentation, an exploration of the business models, because you know, there are three business models, essentially, in terms of marketing to children. One is selling goods uh, to children or to their parents. Uh, the second is selling advertising space targeted uh, at uh, young people. Or the third is collecting and selling personal information uh, from children for resale to others. But it's still very early days, and what is and what is not responsible has not really had time uh, to settle, uh, settle down. I'm going to, I think, kind of touch briefly on the other uh, two issues. The, the point about control, I think, comes back to this issue about whether the systems are designed uh, to make it make safety uh, an automatic uh, feature. It was interesting that the Facebook example, where they changed their terms and conditions around the retention of personal information, and it was used as a uh, met with an outcry, um, and is used as an example of kind of Nader style uh, consumer action enabled. Uh, by digital connectivity. But in reality, it took 175 million visits through to those terms and conditions before anybody noticed the significant change uh, that Facebook had made, and that someone was, in fact, from a uh, consumer organization. So that's interesting. I wonder whether the federal court had anything uh, to do uh, with that. The, the last part I touched on is the issue of, of, of correction, which is about uh, finding redress uh, where things uh, go, uh, go, badly, uh, go badly wrong, and, and better enforcement in ter terms of targeting some of the scams uh, that are there. The, the transatlantic consumer dialogue um, is an initiative which came out of uh, Ralph Nader's uh, campaigning. And um, let, me, let me just... Um, no, um, came out of Ralph Nader's campaigning and developed um, and has been putting final touches last week uh, to a, a new charter of consumer digital rights. 
Uh, and this is digital rights in terms of what ordinary people can do, not digital rights of, of, of industry or, or pampered musicians, uh, dare I say. Um, and looking at that is telling us what we can do, how to promote our safety, um, together with other issues like fair use, the ability to uh, copy goods uh, for your own uh, benefit, uh, wider use of interoperability, uh, and the like. But the issue of privacy uh, is absolutely uh, core. And I think that it is an emerging issue and an emerging movement around creating a safe space uh, for people online. This is moving now so fast that actually your work is all the more uh, important. I hope that government will be open to you, but I hope also the innovators and the business models that are coming through to bring uh, privacy-related services to consumers to encourage better practice uh, by the companies concerned uh, in this field will all play their part in building uh, a safer future uh, online uh, for children, for adults. Not quite the Magna Carta, uh, but something more akin and more appropriate to our times. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ed. Um, there's a few minutes for questions, if anyone's got any questions. No? Yep. Frequently, these are pages and pages long, filled with you know, gobbledygook that is in legalese to protect them, but not actually to inform us. And I think part of your problem is, it's like this central heating thing. You're, you're fine, you tick the box and you carry on. For the vast majority, nothing happens. When it does go wrong, it's always hidden in those terms and conditions that we have no moral or other responsibility for what you've done. Yes, you're absolutely right. It'd be interesting to see a kind of show of hands of, you know, who here uh, tends to tick those boxes uh, and, and kind of move on quickly. Do I have our hands up? This is all anonymous, by the way, except uh, I, I hope. And, and who will read through those, uh, those before ticking them? And have you ever found anything in, in reading through those that... Can we just take the microphone to the back before I answer the question? I think the thing that when I read it and they'll say we have no responsibility, that's when I usually just will back out of it. I won't go any further. If they say we, we assume no responsibility for anything that happens to you while on our site. And I think it's worth reading for that reason alone if you feel at any point it's unsafe. You know, I guess the point is that you know, we don't want to become lawyers, particularly kind of online when these things are kind of moving quite fast. But you're absolutely right in terms of the question and the content of some of these click-on contracts is pretty dubious. Um, you know, the location of where they're based, actually if something goes wrong, how you would try and get uh, redress, which is a major issue in terms of safety. Because if something goes wrong, you need to know that you can get it put right. But we don't have the kind of simple systems the alternative dispute or the, you know, an internet ombudsman or, or, or anything like that. And that's certainly, I mean, the EU Commission is very exercised by how that's holding back kind of cross-border uh, kind of online, you know, trade as well. But that's the way we, you know, we click them on exactly the way that you do. The protections that we have are protections around contract terms more widely. And I think actually this is an avenue where we can use some of the legislation that has come in. Uh, last year was the introduction here in the UK of the, uh, the EU directive, the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive. Um, and, and that governs uh, and looks at some issues of contract terms together with other legislation. Uh, we've done, <clears throat> done some work looking at some of the click-on contracts 
in terms of uh, end-user license agreements uh, are kind of around the software side. Uh, and again, a number of those contracts, we simply had to refer to the Office of Fair Trading because they were kind of not fit. They weren't, you know, kind of worth the screen that they were written on in, in that sense. So I think the only way is to be able to take on companies in a collective way. It, it would be ridiculous to ask, you know, everybody uh, in the country to, to do, I, you know, suggest what you are doing and to be able to, because then you can't do anything. If you don't like what you get, you just have to back out of it. So we need a collective form of taking this on. What, one of the gaps in the legislation is around collective redress. So actually where you get something that means that a whole set of people lose out, it's very hard for those people to get together to get them put right. And that's one of the models, uh, you know, that we would be campaigning for uh, at consumer, uh, consumer Focus. Uh, but I'm, I'm right with you. Um, it's an example of actually where you've got to do something at another level uh, rather than just the individual. Okay. Any further questions? Yeah. One at the back there. Hi there, thanks. I was interested in your comment about um, personal information being the new crude oil and the currency that it's creating. And I was interested in that in respect of the NHS patient's record system that's being developed, which is a huge source of personal information. Um, the government has um, commented on that information being sold as pseudo-anonymized information. Um, but I'm interested more in the market that it potentially may move into and create and who these marketeers in your mind might be and what the implications are for, for us as consumers. Yes, I mean, that's a, we've had the, a case in the States, you know, recently of, of someone talking about their health condition on a social network and then suddenly finding that her insurance company had, um, had cut her insurance. So, sort of, you know, a kind of perfect example of some of those. Uh, yeah, I love, was it pseudo-anonymized? Uh, you said, well, that's a new word as well. We've all learned the word redact in the last 24 hours, but pseudo-anonymized, I'm, I'm not quite sure kind of really what that means. And again, to how far can you, know, can you take this and where do you go? I mean, clearly we, we're moving into a, uh, a world where there's so much more data. Um, there's a big scare, for example, about, well, you know, if kids put stuff up onto, uh, you know, around them partying onto their kind of social network side, they upload photos, you know, what's their employer going to think, you know, in 15 years' time? To my mind, you know, I'm, and as a parent, I'm, I'm quite relaxed about that because I think employers in 15 years' time are going to know what the world is like. It's kind of assuming that employers don't move with, with everything else. So we are in a more transparent world, and you know, of course, in many ways, we have to, uh, you know, have to accept that. But what is the framework for safety? I think is the, the you know, the key discussion really around this, uh, you know, this conference. And just as Ralph Nader was arguing for an overall framework, you know, where should the balance of responsibility lie? Is it down to the, you know, the individual? And I think that was implicit again in, in what, what Graham was saying, what I'm saying is you can't load it all on, you know, to the individual. You need the framework that is there. Now, I've seen some really, some quite good work done in the, the NHS uh, side, although I'm not close to it. And I know that, you know, as a project itself, it's a you know, a, a, bit, a bit of a nightmare, but uh, don't quote me. But um, I've seen some good work done in around that idea about how people could use that kind of data as well. So people particularly with long-term conditions, you know, how, how they can own the information. Um, but it's those protections that we need in place. Firstly, I think we need to see that this is our data. It's a basic principle that if you've got data about me, then I should have the right to correct it or to see it or to check it in, in, in some way. And I think that's a fundamental principle. We think of credit reference agencies, for example, as controlling the data and they'll charge you to have a look at it. I think we need to turn that round to say, no, this is my data and I have the right to check it because it has a huge impact on me uh, if it is wrong. The second is to know that the way that data is handled goes the extra mile in terms of protecting me. And I think that's where the, you know, the HR, HMRC side has, has been so damaging. Before the public sector, it was the private sector that was getting it in the neck. The sort of the nationwide laptop that was you know, stolen with, with 10 million names uh, and the like. 
And we've been, you know, looking at and, uh, you know, I think quite positive about um, the, the breach notification system that runs in California, uh, which is where companies or, 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 or government agencies that hold data lose that data and it's, you know, personal information uh, about people, pseudo-anonymized or, 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 or actual, they then have to notify publicly that that's been the case so that people are aware that they're then at greater risk. And I think that's the kind of uh, innovation which I think can help build uh, public confidence uh, in a system of digital safety. Okay, thanks very much, Ed. Mm. Uh, so, thank you.